Okay, let's get to work. Um, so this is going to be a video for lecture on chapter two, specifically uh, chapter two, sections 2.1, 2.2, uh, and 2.3. Okay, and the topics uh, for all of chapter two anyway, uh, are going to be these. These will be broken down into two or three different video lectures, but the uh, the total number of topics for chapter two is um, first I'm going to talk about functions. I'm going to use arithmetic functions as an example uh, because these are functions that everyone's familiar with. Um, and then with that example in hand, turn to truth functions because truth functions work a lot like arithmetic functions. Um, and so doing the arithmetic functions for First, even though that's not our focus, will help make truth functions more understandable. Then I'm going to go uh, into uh, the definitions of the truth functions. And at first, I'm actually only going to do uh, to uh, conjunction and negation. Uh, and then after that, uh, in a later video, I'll do disjunction and conditional. Um, what we will do in this video is do some evaluation of compound expressions. Um, only ones that use conjunction and negation, but we'll be able to do truth tables to evaluate uh, some compound, or at least one compound expression uh, using both of those. Uh, then later we'll move to the topic of categorizing statements, so using a truth table to determine of a given individual statement, whether that statement is a contingency, a tautology, or a contradiction. And then uh, finally, using truth tables to assess relations between statements, including equivalence, consistency, implication, and finally validity, which is the, uh, the what we've been trying to get to this entire time. So the whole point of chapter two was to get to a point where we could assess argument validity, and that's gonna be our last topic. Okay, so first up, uh, functions. Now, Oh, do I not have my arithmetic function examples here? Okay, maybe not. Um, but, oh, they'll be later. So take these two atomic statements. Okay, I like pizza and I like burritos, P and Q. And let's suppose that P is true. I, I like pizza. And suppose that Q is true. Okay, I like burritos. This is in fact, what the real world is like. Okay, I do like pizza, and it's also the case that I like burritos. Well, if that's the case, then the statement, the compound statement, P and Q, is true. Now, what if I didn't like burritos, though? So P is true, but Q is false, right? Suppose that were the case. Well, then P and Q would be false. Okay, that conjunction would be false if, if I don't like burritos. Notice it's also false if I like burritos, but I don't like pizza. Okay. And finally, suppose I don't like either pizza or burritos, then the conjunction I like pizza and I like burritos would also be false. Okay, now what I, what's interesting about this is, well, there's a lot of things, but here's the first thing I wanna point out. Notice that this specific pattern, this conjunction is true, P and Q is true, when both conjuncts are true, but it's false, you know, in any other case. I like pizza but not burritos, I like burritos but not pizza, I don't like either of them, in all of those cases it's false. That has nothing to do with the fact that the atomic statements are about pizza and burritos. If we change the atomic statements to we have a car and we have a motorcycle, then you get exactly the same pattern, okay? If the first atomic statement were true and the second one was true, then the conjunction of the two would be true. But in every other case, it would be false. Same thing here. Um, N is odd, N is prime, where N is just a, a variable for a a natural number. Um, now, what this means is that, and you can convince yourself these are true, that this is correct. What this means is that whether a conjunction, a conjunction is true or false 
has nothing to do with what the conjuncts are about. Okay, it depends only on whether the conjuncts themselves are true or false. Okay, if they're both true, the conjunction is true. If either one of them or both of them is false, then the conjunction is false. Okay, so in order to determine whether a conjunction is true, that statement is true, the only thing you need to know is whether the components themselves are true or false. You don't need to know what they mean. Okay, if you just know whether the two components are true or false, then you can tell whether the conjunction is true or false. Now let's look at this a different way. Suppose that, so here's what this is. Um, these are keys and these keys are made of metal. Um, this is just a block of metal, let's say it's steel, it doesn't matter. And right now I'm using this red square to be a box. So even though it doesn't really look like a box, just for our purposes, this red square is a box. So I, I got a red square that I can put things in, a red box. Okay, now consider the following statements. And the chunk of metal is in the box, but the keys, which are made of metal, are not in the box. Okay, they're out here. So keys are in the box, that's false. Metal is in the box, that's true. Okay, now let's look at some compound statements. Suppose I said the keys are in the box and the metal is in the box. Well, that's false, obviously. And we know why it's false, because we just looked at conjunction. It's false because one of the conjuncts is false. The keys aren't in the box. But notice that the it's not just the case that we have one false conjunct or one false component and one true component, and that every other statement operator would give us false. Because look, if we use or, keys are in the box, or metal is in the box, well, that's true. Suppose the sentence was, if keys are in the box, then metal is in the box. Well, that's true, because the keys are made of metal, right? So obviously, if, if the keys were in the box, then there would be metal in the box, because the keys are made out of metal. Right, but suppose I said, um, keys are in the box if metal is in the box. No, not necessarily, right? Because this situation, for example, metal is in the box, but keys aren't, right? So it's false that keys are in the box if metal is in the box, okay? Now what's interesting is that every one of these statements, keys are in the box is the first atomic statement, Metals in the box is the second atomic statement, but whether the compound is true or false is going to be different. And the difference is because of these statement operators. They, they uh, give you a different pattern of true and false for the compound statement as a function of the truth and falsity of the input statements. And that's pretty much what we're going to be discussing is how that happens. Okay, so whether a compound statement formed by one of the statement operators is true or false depends on whether the components are true or false. But these different operators, conjunction, disjunction, um, conditional, all of those, they all have a different pattern of true or false components that will make the compound statement true. And so what we need to do is learn those different patterns. Okay, now when I say learn these different patterns, again, I want to emphasize something that I've emphasized before. In a sense, you're not learning these patterns because you already know these patterns. Okay, you know every one of those patterns. Um, if you, even before you signed up for this logic course, if you had a friend and you just knew that this friend loved pizza but hated burritos, you know, a friend who never would order burritos, you know, he claimed he disliked them. If any restaurant where they served only burritos, he would leave. Um, you knew this about your friend. And then suppose you're out at a restaurant and you see your friend on a date with somebody and the, the person he's dating says, oh, I really like pizza and burritos. And your friend says, oh, I like pizza and burritos too. You'd be, that dude just totally lied. Because 
he said the conjunction, I like pizza and I like burritos, but you know the second conjunct is false, so you know the conjunction is false. Okay, and that has nothing to do with this class. This is knowledge that you've had since you were two or three years old about how these things work that allowed you to construct sentences using and and or and if and then and to understand other people when they use these sentences. So in a sense, you are, we're not, I'm not going to be trying to teach you anything you don't know. Rather, the goal is to make explicit some knowledge that you know and you've known for a long time. Give it a name and we're going to sort of discuss that. Okay. So, uh, this, recall, was the something you know. Every, every one of these for conjunction, the example I gave was this one, right? This is where your friend likes pizza but doesn't like burritos, but they say P and Q and you just know it's a lie, right? You know they're lying. Um, all of these are things that you know. I'm not going to go through every example of every one of these. And you also know every one of these, right? You know that the way I've set this up, that if I said keys are in the box or metal is in the box, you would know that I wasn't lying, that that's true. Uh, if I said, if the keys are in the box, then metal is in the box is true. Keys are in the box, if metal in the box, you know is false. So these are all things you know. So we're just reminding you of, of what's already there. So what is a function? Okay, that's what we're getting at, is that these truth, these uh, statement operators are functions of a certain kind. What is a function? A function is something that takes inputs and produces outputs. And you can think of it as a sort of abstract machine, like a bread machine, let's say, that uh, produces as output bread if you give it certain inputs, like flour, yeast, sugar, whatever. Okay. But they're abstract. Now, you're already familiar with functions in the case of arithmetic functions. So I, would, I already brought up arithmetic functions in the case of st statement operators because the arithmetic operators function similar to the statement operators in that they can be used to construct uh, compound arithmetic expressions out of simpler arithmetic expressions. But in this, in, they also have another function. They not only allow you to construct compound arithmetic expressions from simpler arithmetic expressions, they also tell you what the value of that compound expression is as a function of the basic components. So we can think of an addition, uh, let's say the addition function is something that takes two inputs and produces an output. So for instance, if you input four and three, it will output seven. Okay, so you can think of it this way, as this box or this abstract thing. And if you input a four into input one, a three into input two, it will output seven. Okay, now a function can be defined in theory, in principle, in terms of its entire input-output structure. So, for example, with the addition function, we could, in principle, although it would take an infinite amount of time because there's an infinite number of numbers, but we could make a chart like this where we uh, say, okay, what's the first input? That's in column one. Second input is in column two. And then what the compound expression x plus y is, what the output is, is in column three here. So this is saying, look, for the addition function, if the first input is one, the second input is one, it outputs two. If the first input is two and the second input is one, it outputs three. If the first and second inputs are two, it outputs four. Now, of course, you need an infinitely long chart like this because there's an infinite number of numbers in order to specify the entire function. But you could do that in principle, right? That would be a way of specifying the function. And notice that the different arithmetic function, arithmetic expressions symbolize different functions. Okay, so inputting one and one to addition gives you two, but if you input one and one to subtraction, that gives you zero. Okay, notice also that in some cases, order matters. So for um, multiplication, 
Uh, well, let's look at, uh, well, multiplication, it doesn't matter, right? First input one, second input two, outputs two, but if you swap the order, you get the same, right? So addition and multiplication are order invariant, meaning you get the same output uh, regardless of the order of the inputs. But subtraction and division aren't. One divided by two isn't the same as two divided by one. So if the first input is one, second is two, it outputs 0.5 or one half. But if the first is two and the second is one, it outputs two. So some arithmetic functions, uh, order matters. Now for functions, they're all gonna have a single output, regardless of arithmetic or whatever. We're just gonna find functions as always having a single output. But there can be any number of inputs. Um, the only examples we're gonna use, um, and the most common examples are functions with either one or two inputs. We've just seen a whole bunch of examples of two, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Those are all two input functions. An arithmetic function, uh, arithmetic, function, arithmetic function that is one input would be a factorial function. Um, so fa four factorial would just be one times two times three times four. Uh, six factorial would be one times two times three times four times five times six, uh, symbolized with an exclamation point. Um, and that's a function that takes one input and produces one output. Okay. Um, now, I've already talked about uh, this, so I'll just skip through this slide, um, which is that um, some functions with more than one input, obviously if there's only one input, order doesn't matter because you've only got one input, so you can't change the order. But whenever you have two or more inputs, um, order is an issue. And for some functions, order, matter, order matters, and some it doesn't. So what are these truth functions? Well, they're like arithmetic functions, except that instead of numbers being the inputs, truth values are the inputs, and what they output is also a truth value. Now what's great for us is that there are only two truth values, true and false. So the truth functions will be much easier in that way because arithmetic functions, there's an infinite number of possible inputs, whereas with the truth functions, there's only two. And we're just going to assume that every atomic statement is either true or false, is assigned one of those two truth values. Okay, now here's the, one of the key ideas. The statement operators from chapter one, um, conjunction, disjunction, conditional, negation. Not only are they statement operators that sort of form compound statements, that sort of act like glue to make a compound statement from a simpler statement, either atomic or smaller compound statements. They also symbolize truth functions. Okay, they do both of those jobs simultaneously. So let me give you an example. Um, so here's two atomic statements. I left you my house, I left you my car. Um, and suppose I tell you this conjunction. I've, I'm making out my will and I say, I left you my house and I left you my car. So I, I tell you that conjunction. Now what we can do is now I'm just going to be tapping your knowledge of how these operators work. But let's see what the truth value of that compound is as a function of the truth of the, of the inputs. So we're going to make a table like this. And here's the first input, H, I left you my house. Here's the second input, the second conjunct, C. And here's the conjunction. Okay. Now. Suppose that I die, my will gets read, and in that will, it turns out that the first atomic statement is true. I did leave you my house. And then when they get to the part about my car, that's also left to you. So both of the conjuncts are true. Well, then the conjunction that I told you was true, right? When I said I left you my house and I left you my car, that was true, it wasn't a lie. So in that case, the conjunction outputs true when both conjuncts are true. You can see I'm just walking through the same function I walked through earlier, but I'm just going to do it a little more slowly now. 
if they're reading my will, and I left you my house, but I didn't leave you my car, right? The first conjunct is true, but the second conjunct is false. Then I lied, right? If I left my car to someone else, so the second conjunct is false, then that conjunction I told you was false, okay? That was not true when I said I left you my house and I left you my car. Similarly, the other way, if I didn't leave you my house, but I did leave you my car, uh, the conjunction, is false. And also if they're both false, the overall conjunction is false. Okay, so with that in mind, here's the way to think about these statement operators. They do these two jobs. One of them is they produce a compound statement from components. Okay, so you can think of it as I've got an atomic statement, I've got another atomic statement. The conjunction operator is kind of like a piece of glue or something that puts these together into a bigger compound statement. So that's one of the things that the conjunction operator does. The other thing it does is it tells us whether this compound statement, this conjunction, is true or false as a particular function of the truth and falsity of the two conjuncts that it combined. If both of these are true, if, if this first input is true and the second input is true, then this conjunction that it created is also going to be true. If the first input is true, the second's false, then the conjunction that gets created is false. Okay. Uh, by the way, this says four truth functions. I'm only going to go through two truth functions um, right now. The first is conjunction. And we've already done that, so I can be pretty quick. Um, the one thing I want to mention is that I think this is the first time that I've busted out these Greek letters, phi and psi. Why am I using phi and psi up here instead of p and q? Well, the reason is that this is the conjunction uh, truth function table. The table is the same that we saw before. If the first component is true, the second component is true, the conjunction is true. First conjunct, second conjunct, true. The reason I'm using these Greek letters is that um, this statement or this table applies whether the conjunction, the conjuncts, are atomic statements or compound statements. If I used P and Q here, we're using letters to stand only for atomic statements. Okay, so if I put P and Q here and then P and Q, that would sort of imply or at least only verify that this table applied to conjunctions whose conjuncts were atomic. But we want to leave it open whether the, the conjuncts are atomic or compound. So I'm using statement variables. So phi now could be any statement. Phi might be atomic, phi might be compound. Psi, ditto, it might be atomic, it might be compound. It doesn't matter. Whatever those are, atomic or compound, if phi is true and psi is true, then the conjunction phi and psi will be true. So that's why I, I'm using the Greek letters here. And we'll do that actually a lot in chapters two, three, and four. Sometimes we'll, we'll need to use Greek letters, these statement variables. So that's conjunction, you're familiar with that. Let's do negation. Um, negation's easy. Suppose we have this atomic statement, I am married, and we uh, have a negation of that, I am not married. So let's just let I am married be phi. Phi will stand for that. Um, now if phi is true, Suppose I am married, this is, you know, you're on a chat room and you're, you know, you're chatting with someone and they're trying to like get a date from you or something and you say, oh, are you married? Okay, and they give you an answer, right? They're, what they're going to say is I am not married. That's their response to you. Now we want to know, did they lie or not? Well, whether they lie depends on the truth of the atomic statement, right? So if the atomic statement is true, they are married. Okay, suppose that's true. Then not phi, I am not married, is false. Okay, they lied. Now, if the atomic statement is false, right, if I am married, if that has the truth value f, 
than when they said, I am not married. That was true. Okay, so this is, negation is actually pretty simple. It's just the opposite. It always just outputs the opposite truth value of the, um, the truth value that is input to it. Okay, um, I think that's enough. I think I'm actually gonna stop here. What we've done so far is I have talked about um, what the truth functions are, how these statement operators symbolize truth functions in addition to putting compound statements together. And I've walked through um, the first two truth functions, the uh, conjunction truth function and the negation truth function. I'm gonna go ahead and stop this now. Um, and then in the next video, what I'm gonna do is walk through evaluating a compound statement what that means, making a truth table for a compound statement. But I'm gonna give that one its own video because I'm gonna walk through it very slowly. Okay, this is it, study hard.